yeah, I'd like to welcome everybody to the 21st. This is the 21st Features of Design uh, Education um, discussion series. This is the last in this particular series, the last of 2022, and it's the last in this kind of run um, that we've had this year. Um, and we've definitely left a really good one to the end as well. So this is definitely going to be a really good session. We're not entirely sure what's going to happen into the new year. We have got some speakers that we could potentially line up for another series. But we're also thinking maybe about doing something different into the new year. Um, we might actually be wanting to do something more, if you like, with the futures of design education as an idea or as a thing. So, um, yeah, watch out for that one in the new year, um, because I don't know about anybody else, but certainly over the last few years as we've been running these, it's absolutely opened my eyes and my mind to um, a whole range of different possibilities and ways of um, looking at the world. So. It's definitely, there's definitely something of value to, to keep going with this. So in, that, um, uh, in light of that, and in the spirit, if you like, of the whole series, I think what we're going to be doing today um, is particularly apt, particularly relevant. Um, and I'm just going to actually hand over straight away, Leslie, and to you, to let you introduce it and, and to frame it and to tell people what is going to be happening today. So I'm just going to leave you to it, if that's okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so in the background, I'm going to, work on sharing my screen. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, you are not seeing that yet. Um, so I, as I get this ready, let's see. Oh, and it's not, yeah. Okay, good. I think you're seeing it now. Yes. So, um, so the, the name of this presentation is 10 Big Ideas for Pre-Bussel Design Education. And we, um, you'll see in two minutes who is the we, right? But myself and close to 20 colleagues, we are sharing some work that we did over um, a period of two years. Um, and hopefully some people will comment, they'll add in, you know, or, or maybe build on some of our ideas. So a lot of people are gonna talk today. Um, and this is called 10 Big Ideas for Pre-Visual Design Education. And this was a part of the future of design education, not futures, um, uh, the future of design education project, um, which was not was, it is a project that is led by um, Donald Norman and several other people. So on this slide, you see many, many people, um, you know, there was a steering committee of all of these wonderful people, but Don um, and Carl Friedenberg from IBM um, and Meredith um, Davis, um, who's a professor emeritus at Emerita at North Carolina State University. They are the people who lead this project. And this project was about redesigning and redefining um, design education. And uh, as part of this project, many, many groups, subgroups were formed. And you can see here some of the subgroups um, that were formed, including one on doctoral education, one on systems. Um, there was one on futures. I'm not sure where it, it's not on the website anymore. And, um, but we had lots of conversations over maybe two years. And I co-led a group that was brought together to talk about disparate um, cultures and, um, oh my goodness, I can't even read the small type anymore, but you know, design across different cultures. So we put together a group, um, myself and Ronnie Rosenberg, we were the chairs of the group and we were both invited by Joko Muratovsky and Srini Srinivasan from the World Design Organization. And they asked us to put together another working group of people. And you can see that our group had almost 20 people, um, Shalini, Vikram, Ni, um, Alfredo, Edson, Simon, uh, Erico, uh, Chris Ibarra, Ishan Kostler, Arvin Lodaya, Steve Udet, Deborah Litzer, Sadie Redwing, Natalie Robertson, Jorge Rodriguez, um, Fred Van Amstel, and I'm sure that I've missed a few names because um, I didn't see, I didn't hear myself call Adolfo's name. Um, but it was a, a, a long, a, a big group of people and you can actually see here, 
in the next slide that we were from many different places across the world, right? Um, I'm actually quite happy with the representation across the world. Maybe some overrepresentation in some parts of the world, like, um, you know, I'm from the Caribbean and Latin America, and so there was a, a big number of people here. Um, but we, we try to get many, many perspectives. Um, from that, um, as we try to create a way of working, we developed six big themes um, and then had a series of meetings about those themes. And is, I think I saw Fred in the room. So if Fred would like to jump in there, he can. Um, and I can stop sharing or I can continue. Fred, you, you, you could let me know. You can keep sharing. Thanks, Leslie, and uh, welcome everyone. So what, what we discussed um, was really wild. We <laughs> reached so many topics. It's very hard to come up with a synthesis, but we made some effort and we uh, defined these uh, six generative themes. Uh, those themes are somehow um, meant for a sparkling debate. They don't present a specific uh, things to do um, uh, practice. This is what we're gonna present in the big idea. The themes are more like things that we may want to discuss. And theme one is probably a kind of a, uh, over encompassing theme because it, it is the basic framework that we worked uh, together under this concept of pluriverse and pluriversal ways of knowing, making, recognizing that plurality goes as far as to reach different realities. And that implies that we have to have a respectful relationality, or at least discuss what it does it means to respect in different uh, realities, because uh, my respect is not the same as the respect in another reality and where some another concept might exist. And uh, pluriversal design strategies, methods, and content is probably um, the most practical theme. Pluriversal design research as well, pluriversal communication. And uh, the last one is also an, uh, a, a, a big uh, theme that uh, encompasses the other ones is our conclusion that every uh, design activity is also a learning activity. And you have to think about uh, design in terms of space for learning and space that can, where well, we can learn different uh, ways of knowing and making. That's in a nutshell, the connection between the themes. Okay, I had to figure out how to unmute myself. Um, so I actually am sharing in the chat our um, presentation, and I'm, I'm gonna skip a few slides and see if Adolfo, who I believe I saw, um, if Adolfo would like to talk about some of the big shifts that we um, identified or recognized for um, pluriversal design education before we get into the actual 10 big ideas. So Adolfo. Certainly. <clears throat> Thank you, Leslie Ann and Fred. Yeah, so um, in terms of pluriversal shifts, um, yeah, I can say that I think there was general understanding in this group that uh, many of the problems of our time are to an extent rooted in, in linear reductionist understandings of the life world and really the, the dominant economic models of the global north are to a large extent based on this idea, for instance, the notion of uh, unlimited growth on a finite planet. Uh, many authors, including uh, Capra and Luisi, uh, refer to this as, as one of the roots of, of the problems of our time. And, and really within the cultural sphere, um, there's also uh, something analogous to this, what uh, Tony Fry refers to as elimination design. So, you know, in the name of economic progress, what we've seen in the past century is the destruction of vernacular design, uh, traditional ecological knowledge, indigenous cultural practices, uh, which really nourished and sustained millions of people. So an alternative to this linear or reductionist way of knowing is, is what have often what is often referred to as uh, ontological design, which in the most basic terms describes a circular rather than linear understanding of the life world, uh, specifically the, the circular relation between human design activity and the designed world, uh, with each one shaping the other, uh, almost as, as in a feedback loop. And Anne-Marie Willis provides a really good description of this when she writes, we design our world while our world 
acts back on us and designs us. Uh, and, and this concept of ontological design leads us to what is in essence uh, a relational worldview, a deeper understanding uh, of how all things are interconnected. And from this ontological and, and relational perspective, there are really, I think, sig significant implications for design education and practice. And, and one of the major implications, which we often discussed in this group, is that traditional local and or land-based knowledge may help us conceive of alternative futures in design education. Uh, for instance, perspectives derived from the local, uh, from the global south, south rather, and the indigenous world, uh, which often provide non-linear and cyclical understandings of reality, uh, may offer uh, important tools uh, for criticism and uh, and sustainment. So, those are just some thoughts on on these pluriversal shifts, and I'll leave it back to you, uh, Leslie Ann. Okay, so. Um... So we're going to get right into the 10 big ideas. And I shared the presentation um, in the chat. And so people can actually go back to them over and over and have a look. And this is a, a document in progress. Um, this might be the first draft. It might change a few times afterwards. But the first big idea, I don't know if Alfredo or Natalie is in the room, because um, we wanted to talk about what some of these ideas might look like in practice. Um, is Alfredo here, I think? Borero? Yeah, yeah, yes. OK, yes. Here I am. Uh, mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. It's, uh, as Frederick thought, uh, it's difficult to uh, synthesize uh, all what's happened in, in our group. Um, and this idea of the possibilities of putting into the practice uh, this um, universal uh, agenda, uh, in, in my humble point of view, uh, in the concern to the education, we must be careful not to understand things too quickly. When it comes to practice, the idea of pluriverse and the pluriversal must be treated without reducing uh, too fast all alternates to uh, enforced homogenization uh, under the assumption that interests and designation operate in the same sense within all human groups. In that sense, even if we talk about issues such, for instance, interculturality, for example, it is advisable to avoid a metric of totality or to take for granted that uh, there are uh, comparable discrete units uh, that uh, culture one, culture two, culture three, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, are just uh, the same. Uh, the, the development of sensitivity according to 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 place to to language is very very important and for me was the principal learning of our sessions this this this, this idea of of cross us perspectives of uh, environment and teachings and, and learning um, give us a basis to, to think that it's important to think that Although the materiality is one or seems the same from our understanding, it is not a question for me of an uh, encounter between different perspectives on, on the same one, uh, the same one that is already decided that it is, but um, always from the dominant position. But perhaps we speak of several overlapping, um, all encompassing samenesses. Yeah, the, 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 this idea of, of pluriverse uh, implied that perhaps the same materiality, the, the same practice um, convokes a point of convergence between several different same, different uh, domains, not different perspectives, because this idea of perspectives um, perhaps make us to think that what is real is already solved and, and this is a, a big, a huge problem. Um, perhaps on the, on the same materiality, different, different, totally ideas of universe uh, converge, and and that is very, very important. Mm -hmm. I, I I return to you the. Okay. Um... Yes, so the big idea one is about every community practicing the design of itself and people in um, 
these communities are the practitioners of their own knowledge and big idea too, and both are, are related to what Alfredo was saying, says that unlike modernist traditions, relational approaches to design address multiple ways in which things are connected, nature, culture, mind and body and us and them. And that's also connected to what Adolfo was telling us earlier. The big idea three, um, design with and by people and not for people. And uh, uh, Fred, you had wanted to um, expand on this one. Yeah, just very quickly, it's very uh, obvious, but uh, it's difficult to accept this, that people design uh, their lives, they at least design their communities. And if we want to position ourselves in, the, in this pluriverse, we must not think that we are gonna be the designers of these worlds. And because these worlds are already designed <laughs> and they are designed by the same people that inhabit these worlds. And that, that, that's why it doesn't make sense to design for people uh, because they are already designing. If we think that they lack something, they lack design, we are not being very political. So, so designing with or designing, recognize the designing by is what we prefer and think it's more political. So. Yes, thank you. Um, design, uh, big idea for there's no one universal design history. And I'm going to call on Edson, very teacherly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Um, big idea for, uh, as Leslie's saying, is there's uh, no one universal design history really talks about like how designers really need to learn how to study alternative design histories. And, and this comes from the premise also that uh, a lot of us, for example, have been taught with histories of design that have been either uh, biased and or uh, predominantly coming from Western narratives and, and a, a very Eurocentric kind of perspective. And, and what we are arguing is that then we need to expand our understanding of design history uh, and, and accept and acknowledge the fact that there's just no one universal design history. And therefore, uh, things that we can do is that then how is it that we can maybe expand our understanding of, let's say, local histories as they are also simultaneously happening with global histories? Uh, how is it that then we're looking at maybe um, the different communities, their own stories, uh, looking at their local circumstances, like what Adolfo had mentioned before, also about like looking at local, like the geography, the climate, culture, politics, technology, resources. And that then just like what Fred was saying is that then also how is it that then, because we understand this sort of local histories as part of these larger histories, um, how is it that then the design decisions we make are actually relevant to the region or the community for which we are designing with uh, and for? All right, thank you, Edson. Uh, big idea number five, um, we need to introduce radical empathy in design. Um, no one wanted to touch that <laughs> big idea today, so I'm gonna move on. Um, big idea six, the studio is not the only place where design happens. Me, I saw you came on. Um, you wanted to talk about that one a bit, Me. Um, yeah, hi, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Hi, Leslie. Hi, hi, folks. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, I think the, the big idea around here is, is kind of, I think, take, taking our learning outside of the spaces of the studio, the spaces of the academy. Um, and I think to, to contextualize this for me, um, I think during, during the lockdown, um, I came across um, the work of an architect called uh, Paul Oliver, um, a British architect. And in his obituary in the Guardian newspaper um, from August 2017, um, the opening kind of paragraph kind of um, really kind of blew my mind away in terms of what it says about, I guess, our disciplines and, and kind of what we think of our, about ourselves. So it says this, um, of the 11% um, of houses around the world, sorry, only 11% of houses around the world were designed by architects. Paul Oliver, who died aged 90, devoted himself to studying the remainder. Architecture, that, that was of the people rather than built for them. 
And I think uh, as designers, um, and especially largely as educators, um, like I said for myself, that 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 opening paragraph to his obituary was was very humbling, because we we tend to think that you know we know everything and everything comes from the spaces in which we dwell, and uh, probably as has been hinted before me by by colleagues that in this modality of design that we are looking at, I think we're going to places where the knowledge is. And we are not just the only purveyors and holders of that knowledge. So I think the idea that the studio is the only place where design education happens is, is a very archaic one. And one where in looking at the pluriversal universe that we're talking about, I think I, always, I, I, I call it in terms of an idea of we need to like quantum shift our students thinking, you know, move them literally to new realities and, and moving them out of the, out of the, the academy space, out of the um, studio space is, is one of those ways of quantum shifting their thinking basically. So uh, I think that's my, my take on that. Okay, Liz. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go back to big idea five for a bit because um, Shalini, uh offer to jump in <laughs> yeah thank you thanks um thanks everybody and thank you for these great big ideas i just wanted to uh underscore the need to introduce radical empathy and design and really it's about um re-looking at our relationship with design from transactional to relational and in doing that um developing a skill of empathy and not just um, saying that we are being empathetic, but really looking into who we are and being self-reflective of how who we are in this in um, in the design process, our power, our positionality, and recognizing that and knowing when to step up, step back, and in developing radical empathy. I really want to emphasize that empathy is never a proxy for a lived experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, so big idea number six, no, number seven, um, designers need to design for resilience and change. And then big idea number eight, um, design can future proof marginalized cultures. Edson, I think you wanted to jump back in. Yes. So with the uh, big idea number eight, design can future proof marginalized cultures. Um, we were we we're talking about how how is it that then can designers maybe help reclaim or revive local design subcultures that have been marginalized and related to what Shalini had mentioned about understanding our positionality as designers, we acknowledge that there are power structures, of course, that kind of uh, exist and the systems of oppression that also then exist. And so then therefore we acknowledge then and also then how is it that we're able to maybe empower uh, especially marginalized and oppressed communities. Um, and this also, again, goes back to how we might then analyze uh, local and immediate culture. Uh, how is it that we understand the, uh, the kind of ethical, spiritual, and aesthetic components of a design culture? Uh, we, we then kind of uh, use, let's say, again, history as, an, as a way to understand uh, maybe use participatory design processes and ethnography in understanding those processes um, so that then uh, marginalized cultures are also then future-proofed and then also then empowered. Okay, thank you. And big idea number nine was designers should understand what industry means, not only on a macro level, but also the micro level and local level and in a range of scales of production. Um, I don't think Arvind was able to join the call, but if Arvind is here, someone could tell me. Um, Arvind uh, Lodaya, who was also part of the, the committee, um, last night in our back and forth via email, Arvind had wanted to make the point that um, design needs to move away from clients, you know, and that's, you know, that was that was a, me a message that he wanted to bring when we talked about big idea number nine. I don't know if anyone in the group wants to. Um, yes, I want to that. add. Okay. We usually think about uh, industry as capitalist uh, industry, and uh, but we may also have different ways of production that are non-capitalist and not even industrial 
that these ideas might be well fit to contribute towards, for example, solidarity economy circuits are a good example of uh, non-industrial, but still uh, an economic uh, context where designers can uh, contribute towards. So we have to extend, for example, the understanding of uh, the um, professional roles that designers may play in the future if we want to uh, explore post-capitalist and contribute because people are already exploring that. We want to stay apart from these discussions, I guess not. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you, Fred. And then the last one I also would like um, someone to comment on because again, I think, so organizing our meetings was very difficult because we were around the world. So some of our members couldn't join because of the time. And Natalie, um, was not able, I think, to join today. I'm kind of looking to see if she's here. Um, but big idea number 10, designers need to learn how to read the cultural values in the stories that communities share. Um, we talked a lot about culture um, over the many months that we met. Um, would anyone in the group want to jump in here and reflect on this one in action? All right, we're staying away from this one. Um, but you Hi. know, yes? Hi, Leslie. Hi. Hi, I want to contribute to the... Hi, Ralitza. Oh, I Ralitza. want to contribute to the... Yeah, about the cultural values. I think that the cultural values actually become very fundamental in all our design processes. And it's very core for us to actually understand local context. And then that will actually inform the design process and design solutions that we um, collectively design with communities. And in that sense, um, the cultural values actually would direct how the design will be. And that, of course, can be shared through the local stories and all of that. And so understanding context um, allows us to actually curate all these local values and stories. And that brings that kind of uniqueness of design that is very responsive and can also bring that kind of a pluriversal dimensions to the solutions that would, would come out. So that is the bit I'd like to add for big idea 10. Over to you, Leslie. Thank you, thank you, Deborah. Um, so th th these were, um, you know, that's kind of like how our meetings went. You heard a wide range of accents and perspectives, and um, we dealt with a lot of different time zones as we worked. Um, and then also within the last few weeks, we, we will, we've been writing about this process. So there's a paper coming out, um, hopefully in a bit. Um, but we had to think about what pluriversal design is not. Um, so I'm gonna call on Fred and Alfredo, um, one of you to jump in and talk about what, what pluriversal design is not. Alfredo, you wanna start? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, if, if decide what pluriversal design is, is difficult. The, the decide what it is not is even harder, but I was looking the chat, uh, and and I was trying to make sense of what I trying to tell. For me, uh, uh, a key word here is uh, it, heterogeneity. Uh, the 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 uh, I, these ideas of of global and even the conception of the academy runs the risk of arise nuances, particularities, specificities. Uh, the perhaps pluriversal design is not uh, a, a frame um, concept that can swallow of engulf particularities too too fast. Uh, perhaps it hasn't arrived to to make answers so fast, but to to make uh, complex uh, questions. I insist ideas as world, culture, universe, even design uh, cannot jump from human group to human group and from language to language and from place to place 
without being revised in their expressions and priorities. As Diana Alparan told me yesterday, a lot of people that have their own uh, alphabets of creation to name uh, the, that way, have their own priorities are not uh, are those of the enterprises or even uh, of the of the academic. We, we must um, perhaps pluriversal design is not uh, a, a way to to include dissolving uh, difference. Otherwise, can be as toxic uh, and uh, as classic mainstream design has been. The, the balance between creation and destruction process uh, that the exercise of uh, design in, uh, implies must be continually reviewed. And I perhaps, uh, as Frederick, uh, some, sometimes are worried about this idea of that, that universal design just be a, a buzzword that replace another words uh, to re reinscribe the, the, the same dynamics. Yes, so pluriversal design is not the melting pot that uh, have been found in other multicultural settings. So it's not about uh, dissolving differences, uh, uh, Diana Gonzalez just posted in the, the chat. And it's also not about uh, an approach or a method that can include uh, all the, those differences into uh, um, the same thing, the same idea, the same concept. An universal concept because then the pluriversal becomes a universal design and it's probably a contradiction in itself to call it that so it's all about horizontality and seeing how things are different in their own differences in their own terms and staying uh, cool with that not trying as quick as possible to equalize things and to say this is the same as that well no 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 it's not and it's fine not being the same so staying uh, different is nice too. Yes. Um, okay. Yes. I, I, I. Yeah. I think we had lots of interesting conversations again about what is not. Um, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what um, Alfredo and and Fred said. You know, I think that very often we think that it's the same conversation as diversity, equity, and inclusion when actually maybe those conversations, those DEI or JEDI or whatever acronym you wanna use, those conversations are more about convergence. And in this pluriversal design process, we are actually about divergence and complexity and seeing that complexity rather than converging to something. Um, and you know, maybe our last slide is why is this important? Um, me, I, I, you are one of the people that I was asking, why is this important? Um, and this is a point where anybody I suppose, can jump in. <laughs> so I saw, I, yeah, yeah. I, I saw someone um, post, and I've been following the conversations, and they seem very uh, heavy and academic. And I guess being D, in the DRS space, this, this would be very heck of any, an academic. Uh, someone posted, um, it seems, it reminds me of metamodernism. And um, in a way, I'm very much kind of like, <laughs> I was going to type in and say, it's not meta anything. It is what it is, you know? And I think those kind of conceptualizations, as soon as something comes, we have to try and like put it into a, a, a category, right? We have to put it into a box. And most of the times the categories and boxes which we put these things in come from a very um, Western Eurocentric modality about things. So if we see something and we can't understand it, it's like, okay, let's look at what it is and let's try and categorize it and put it into this thing so that we can understand it. And maybe for me, pluriversality is about, no, it is what it is. You acknowledge it for what it is, you respect it for what it is, it's not against who you are or any of the other universes that exist within um, the, the sphere of life on this planet. And so I think it's a respect of the other because you are the other, actually. You know, I mean, it's an old kind of like, you know, that old, you know, this is a cliche in, in I don't know, Southern African circles, you know, that whole Ubuntu thing, I am because of you, you know, kind of thing. So. It's important because I think it, it gets us out of the, the box 
this this kind of calcified thinking that that most of us have come through through the western system of there's there's only one way of seeing things there's only one way of being there's only one way of thinking there's only you know and i think this this basically for me it just opens the the whole space out you know um it it uh, in in kind of our discussions for me it was about the tapestry the mosaic of what it means to be a human being on this planet you know and i think for me pluriversality um um enables that um basically so hopefully i've i've, I've made sense um in in a not too academic way but that's another thing too it's not an academic exercise it's it's a lived exercise a lived embodiment of what people are living through um, um, all over this planet basically and i think for me it's about seeing other people you know seeing other ways of being seeing other ways of living seeing other ways of thinking you know and re and respecting those as much as they might seem um, strange air quotes or not comfortable from from our positionality because ultimately everyone has their pos positionality you know whether we agree with it or not and i think for me pluriversality is is an acknowledgement of everyone's positionality um basically um anyway that's um yeah all right um i'm gonna continue to um, open up the space for conversation. Um, I'm going to stop sharing uh, and then um, see if first other people from um, the working group would like to jump in and then if we have questions and, and stuff like that. So I'm going to end our show now and stop sharing. All right. So, um, Derek, where are you? <laughs> okay, I see you, Derek. Um, well, first, the first invitation to um, other people from from the working group. I don't know if everyone got a chance to chime in and say anything. Um, would anyone like to add um, to the why is this important? No, well, I, we have to. Yeah. Someone has to say that, right? So the whole future of design education project started with Don Norman saying we need to change design education, right? And he seemed to have a real, a very clear idea what has to change. But then he invited us. <laughs> that was his, was his mistake, right? Because we really complicated the whole thing, and he was so puzzled when he met us to deliver our results. But he kept thinking about it because it's very challenging. Yeah, if you are used to stay on the top of university, on the top of uh, industry, on the top of the uh, so-called one single world, <laughs> the center of the universe, and you feel like uh, this is challenging because it says there are other places in the, in these universes that do not comply with your universe, that do not uh, that your rules do not apply, that your design methods do not work that your design theories cannot predict what's going to happen. And, and, and hence, <laughs> if we have to change design education, if there is a future for design education, it should be futures. <laughs> now, kudos on Derek for choosing wisely name for your project. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Fred. Nobody's ever accused me of wisdom, so thank you. That's... <laughs> I mean, it would be, I mean, oh, sorry, Leslie, I'll, I'll let like crack on, you crack on. We can't hear you, Leslie, muted. Oh, I, yeah, okay. No, I was I was saying, Derek, that we should share that the S came as a response actually to the future of design education project, um, really, because within... Uh, the EDSEC group of the DRS, we, I think, challenged, and Derek, you can add, you know, but we, we challenge the idea of one future. And that's really the perspective um, of this working group as well, that there isn't one future of design education. There isn't one 
way of doing design. There are just, there are many ways and we have to kind of learn to live with that complexity of the many ways of doing design. Juan had a question, Juan Montalban. I don't know if you wanna. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for, for sharing uh, this. Uh, lots of information, super interesting. And um, my, I'm, I'm sorry, because I, I will be like real time thinking, but, <laughs> uh, but I think uh, I was wondering, uh, because I also some, in some way involved in this uh, approach. And one thing I was uh, thinking lately is about the, this aspects of the limitations of uh, uh, a universal approach. And um, uh, I, I, I found that uh, and it really resounds with what has been said in, in, this, in this meeting in terms of um, perhaps universal design is not, and I really like that, that's, that uh, exercise, perhaps universal design is not uh, um, a how, but rather an acknowledgement of what design is. So it, would, it, won't, let, it won't lead to a methodology of design. And that's really interesting to, to think about because uh, in terms of the design education, uh, I was thinking this with my students. Uh, if we start to acknowledge that there, are, there is a diverse ways of design and everyone is designer um, from, a different, from different perspectives, then how do you approach this in a way of design? And that's the, the thing, that there's no only one way. And then well, what I was speaking with my students is that um, then we, we, what we can teach and to uh, designers, for instance, in my, in my university in Peru, is uh, how can we uh, be part of a community wherever we are uh, around and wherever my students uh, get involved, how do they can be, be part of that community? Because I think that designing in the pluriverse is building community and then the community designs <laughs> in a way. Uh, so there are a lot, lot of things that can be developed, I think, in the, in the future coming and in terms of how can we, uh, in, in the scenario of universities, of course, how, how can we teach our students um, to be part of society, to be part of communities and understand their ways of design. Um, so that was my, my reflection. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions or comments or feedback? Osla? Hello. Yes. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, okay, uh, it was very, I think it's very thought provoking. Uh, what I would like to say is that for example, I was. Uh, I think that, for example, in Turkey, in Istanbul, we have created some uh, models of engaging with the society, with with business, according to the to our local needs, and uh, I think these are very uh, unique examples and very creative examples. But uh, all the time, there is this feeling that we have to register these <laughs> examples these models otherwise they are not known you know because they are local examples and we have to get uh, international registration approval from design research society or you know places like this to be considered as valuable because you know we we live in the periphery and sometimes we uh, we develop these uh, publications in our own language. There is always the task of, you know, uh, in translating everything into English to tell uh, other people about it. So there is also this additional task of uh, translation. So I feel that 
um, this kind of this field of registration of your work to be considered valuable or you know to get approval is a kind of uh, I don't know I mean I, I I feel frustrated about it really through all my career I felt frustrated about it and I kind of operated despite these uh, difficulties. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aslam. Um, it, for me, and I, I think, you know, in one of our closing meetings, uh, a lot of us talked about being seen, um, you know, because because we just had then this opportunity to connect with people in New Zealand, in India, in Brazil, in Colombia, you know, and talk about some of the, these kinds of frustrations that you talk about, Oslem. Um, and, you know, sometimes we went into the, into the discussions and we said, well, if nothing else, <laughs> you know, because we didn't know what Donald Norman and, you know, what they would do with this, but we, we, would say sometimes, if nothing else, at least our community is getting stronger um, in this week. Mm -hmm. um, Azra? Hello, uh, thank you for this beautiful conversation. Uh, I'm gonna add like, I think coming from a, that sweet spot between being a student and being in academia, I think it's like really important for us to like acknowledge the the freedom that like being in the academia gives and engaging with these concepts. And I'm thinking a lot about like the struggle of a student to transition from that like free reflection space that they have in the university and like the challenge to, um, to embody, to practice these values when they actually like transition into a working space and like helping them to find that space where they can actually like uh, bring that into their practice because like we see that with a lot of the students that like in the courses they engage with these and then outside when they go into the industry they have to wear different hats and they have to like navigate how to represent themselves to the outer world and that outer world is demanding like a whole different face a whole different hat so uh, I think it's really important to like bring that uh, when we talk about design education like what does it take for a student to practice these into these conversations to uh, as we build up on this work. Thank you. Uh, would anyone like to add to or comment on Azra's um, reflection? I'm, I'm just looking around the core group. Yeah, Leslie, Ann, could I be really cheeky and just augment and um, that? That, that question because I think it's a really important one the link has been made in you know the, the 10 big ideas the link between um sort of design and learning I think that's quite an important claim to make um and I think it makes um Azra's comment and question really quite important I'll be keen to know a bit more about that you know how is it that we activate this so for example if we should be designing with and by people and design is learning then does that mean that we should be learning with and by people you know, to what extent do we need to almost de-academicize what it is that we do, de-studio what we do? Um, I take a very different view to studio, but that's, that's by the by. Um, what's that link between learning and design and how in itself does learning or the process of learning, how might it be a bit more plural um, in, in some ways? Um, yeah, good question, Azra, by the way. Maybe it's not an answer. I, I, I don't expect anybody to say, here's the solution. Um, maybe it's, it's one for a future debate but yeah it's an important question I would suggest yeah so um there, there's another document that we so there's a document that we shared and I'm going to ask one of my colleagues to share it again in the chat if people missed it but there's another one that we will share where we have a more detail about some of the conversations that we had and you know like kind of related to that question or comment we we spend a lot of time talking about places of learning and um, through reversal spaces of learning and maybe hierarchies. Um, you know, like we talked about the design class in the marketplace, for example, or, you know, like really outside of the academic context that we were in. Um, and another conversation that we had that for me was 
I think it changed my practice um, after we had that conversation is that we, we had a long conversation about what is the aim of history and, uh, you know, kind of like, do we need to learn design history in the way that we learn it? Or is it that we need to understand history and over time, maybe it's specific design history that we've been learning, but, but we could be learning different design histories, you know? And um, I just recall, um, I think maybe Ronnie or Joko might have led that conversation about what is like history versus hist historiography and which, which one do we need to be teaching students? And I, again, I guess neither one is really a response to Azra's comment, but I think, you know, we really just synthesize the big ideas but we'll probably also put out the bigger documents that where we started to go into the nitty gritty of what a curriculum could look like. And I mean, I'm seeing a few people on the screen. I don't know if like Adolfo, Edson, or anyone else who was in some of these conversations would like to add. Um, can I, can I jump in there? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so. Um, I think the, the, the bigger document, which um, Leslie is referring to, I mean, it's quite, I mean, I think it's almost like 40 pages or so, so which possibly will be disseminated later, but it's, it's quite a well thought out document. I went back and looked at it when we were asked to do this presentation and as we were putting together that paper and I was like, we did a lot of work that a lot of times you don't realize only on reflection when you go back and read through what people have done. So say, I'm just gonna read, I've got the document in front of me, but I'm just gonna read like two paragraphs from the, the introduction to the theme six, which looks at spaces of learning, right? And so the, we, there were like mini essays defining the themes. And so for, for spaces of learning, the, the mini essay was this, um, the various environments, physical and virtual contexts of how we teach and learn have embedded issues of inclusion and exclusion. Traditionally, the physical studio has been the space for learning and making. In a more diverse design context, the land and the community may be significant places of learning, right? Like I always tell my students, you don't need a classroom to be learning. I can teach you under a tree, okay? Um, so going on, empowering education, is situated, and this is Shaw um, quoted from 1992, and therefore sites external to the studios of the uh, educational institutions would also be important venues to embed the curriculum in local culture and context, promoting cultural awareness and connections. When developing educational projects with community partners and or stakeholders from outside the university, such sites can also serve as a valuable source of information. I'm eliciting, for example, ecological knowledge, oral history, and or collective memory. Places in themselves can provide essential forms of knowledge and lived experiences that are not easily replicated within a conventional classroom. So that's just the two opening paragraphs of that essay, which framed the, the theme six, spaces of learning. So if, if you, you, you were to, to get, gain access to, to the broader body of work that came out of this this whole exercise i think a lot of the questions that people are putting into the the chat um you'd find that we we um yeah we we, we tackled and we we dug quite deeply into it and thinking about what is this thing that that we're talking about um i think this is is, is really like a snapshot it's almost like a TikTok, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a TikTok video. And yeah, you ain't gonna get much depth in TikTok videos, you know, but it will give you an idea, it will give you a taste of what we were thinking and, and, and hoping to achieve. Um, and hopefully um, it's, it's, it's I, th I think for me also, the, the idea around design, right? And, 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 and how, at least from my, perspective and how it's, it's been taught you know so there's this idea of like design like it's around also like this idea of design thinking you know so there's design thinking that's tm you know trademarked right and and i always make the notion that you know take away design just put western before design thinking because to me that's what it is 
It's Western design thinking. It's not design thinking, right? But that's me and that's my positionality. And so when we talk about um, design also, for me, there's this almost this notion because of where we come from and uh, as I said, a very Western modernist notion of what design is, it's almost as if design has, has been, just as design thinking has been branded, design in itself has, is, is branded and there's almost design with a TM or a, a copyright or a, re, a registration sign next to it. And I think what, what this is saying, um, um, as a gentleman before put there, that this is, this is what design is actually. It's not that design TM, which, which I was educated in and that most of us were educated in. It's not that design copyright or, or design with a little registration mark next to it. This is design that is, that is of um, um, the planet and of peoples and, and communities and, you know, and so I think that, that, that it's almost kind of like we, we, we need to realize that um, going back to that quote of, only 1% of buildings are built by architects, right? <laughs> that design has been, has been, right? Before there was a design TM. And I think sometimes we need to be able to step back and realize, okay, yeah, in, in the greater scheme of things, you know, we just but a, a small blip in the history of humankind right? If we're talking about design and all of these things, I'm reading a paper that Don Norman wrote uh, about the future of design education from 2020, and he's looking at the history of design education as it is now from the, let's say, 1800s and all of that. And I mean, that's just from the 1800s, right? And even he makes the point that in, in the paper, they were looking at very much like um, 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 British, um, some Scandinavian examples, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but making the point that there was a lot happening in French design education that was very radical and ahead of what was happening in England at the time. But he, he, he admitted that he has not a lot of knowledge about that type of design education. And this is, we're talking about France here, which is right in the center of Europe, right? but we don't have much information about the design education that was happening in France that those in England thought was much more progressive than what was happening in England. So how much more then, if I'm extrapolating that we, we, we have a blind sight or let's say maybe Don Norman had a blind, uh, blind sight to what is happening in, in France vis-a-vis -vis design education, right? And France is one of the centers of Western civilization, air quotes, right? Then what about the rest of the planet, right? Me, what I'm about all those? Yeah. You for yeah. a second, um, I, I know that we are almost at time, but I know Michael has had his hand up for like a long time. So, Michael, you want to squeeze your, your question in just before we close? Is it a question? We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I think I'll start. I hope I have lost my thread. I'll start with a comment uh, to Derek uh, about learning. And a while back, I saw a wonderful talk by Alan Neuringer, which is a video on YouTube that he gave a few years back at the Quantified Self Foundation. And he is a behaviorist. And he's been doing experiments and self-observation for 30 plus years. Yeah. And with for about an hour, he's presenting with great enthusiasm all the mistakes that he and his students have been doing for the past 30 years, yeah, in self-experimentation. And you suddenly see that doing research, designing, playing, and learning are all the same and they are part of life. Yeah. So they are different sides of the same coin. There's a designing, learning, playing, and researching. It's explore, ex, explore, exploring life. And I can only recommend to watch this talk. It's beautiful because he's laughing all the time about his own mistakes and errors. So and now back to uh, your frameworks. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, for your wonderful presentation. Really radical. I don't know how this is going to 
take root in our capitalist system, but it's good to have something like it, yeah? Um, I, as a cybernetician, I love that there is circularity in there. And now my question is, where do we find the local? Because the pluriverse is about many years, many different years. So it's not a history of design, it's histories of designing, yeah? Uh, and so where do we find the small, local, open, and connected, the local in your framework? It's there. Does anyone want to talk about where it is? And Derek, I don't know about our time. I know we're over now. Well, I certainly um, don't mind if you wanted to keep going for a wee bit. Yeah, I mean, we might wrap it up for the sake of the recording and a few other bits and pieces. Yeah, but yeah let, finish up this one and then... Um, um, I mean, now I might pick on people because <laughs> I know Adolfo is one who talks a lot about place, um, who led lots of conversations about place. I know that um, Fred um, also has like very particular ways of working. I, Fred, I'm putting words into your mouth. You know, as a, a, a designer um, in Brazil, I think that place is very representative in, in the way that you work. So either one of you want to... Let me put you all on. Yeah, I just want to say that pluriverse uh, sometimes is understood as hyperlocality, just uh, ignoring the universals, and I think that's not fair, because uh, what what this means is that every locality can be in an universe in itself. Every locality can has the right to universalize and be recognized as powerful and as human as any creation done at the tradition of historical centers that have established as this to call the universe. So it's not about destroying the concept of universal or the universe. It's about pluriversalizing or plur make it plural so we can have multiple competing, sometimes diverging uh, concepts and realities that complements, but also sometimes that uh, challenges uh, themselves. Can I add something? Because this this question about thinking about the local is huge question. For me, the problem is to think the, the local too generally. When 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 we approach to 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 particular place, there not exist such a things as as mountain in general. As, as we are accustomed to say, user in general, local lo, local must be thinking in a local way. The 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 radical singularity of, of the local must be important because for me, a big problem of the uh, academic language is to capture the variety of things, of the singularity of phenomena uh, uh, on, on, the, on these general concepts, even the concept of concept that dispense of with our thinking about the project. As the, uh, the mountain of the project, of the research in a general way, our, our, our particular research uh, team works and, and so on. But this, and, and I put limit to myself, but I enjoy that anarch, anarch co creative chat was very, very interesting. The, the reign of ideas of everyone. I hope the, the, the concept by suggestion just follow. Uh, each other tracks on the networks on literature and keep the, the communication flowing in, in, in the regard is very important. Say so thank you everyone for this marvelous session. Very provocative indeed. Thank yeah. you, Alfredo. Um, so I'm gonna ask if someone could put the link back into the chat again, because my chat has frozen. <laughs> I, can't, um, I can't access the chat. And maybe if someone can put the link back in the chat, people should be able to add comments to that document that we have shared. You know, so like Devon and Shaheen asked, well, how do you contribute? You can add comments. And then we will also prepare another version of the, the 40 page document, which we'll ask Derek to distribute to people who came to this event. And again, you'll be able to add comments so that you can add to the conversation. We don't. No, um, you know, like me talked about how deep we went. We went very deep and then actually had to come back up, you know, because um, we wrote that 40 page document. And then actually afterwards we were asked, well, can you do just do 10 steps? And so we came back out and we did the 10 steps. Um, 
And so, you know, that 40 page document might, might never be seen except as we circulated among each other. So that's why we're gonna create this version that, that people can, can read for themselves. Um, so Derek, maybe I'll hand it over yeah. to you. Again. No, definitely, and thank you very much, Leslie. And yeah, we'll, we'll share that and make sure everybody gets it. Um, I think that's actually what's been making me slightly uncomfortable towards the end of this session. Um, it's kind of like the where next question. There seems to me something particularly important that should not and cannot be lost. Um, in both the collective wisdom um, that's obviously taken place over the last period of time. So I suppose my first question was going to be, um, and I know we don't have very much time yet, but even just really quickly, I don't know where or what um, the state of the project is, the future singular of design education project. I know that you've had an influence in that project and that's fantastic, but I don't know, you maybe aren't, aren't comfortable with answering the question of well, what is going to happen next with that project. If that's the case, we can maybe continue the chat after we end the recording and stuff like that. That'd be absolutely so, fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there's a public thing that I guess we could say. Okay. Um, so yeah, cool. we just, maybe about seven of us um, co-authored a paper for Shiji. Um, so there will be a special issue of Shiji, I think summer 2023, where the different working groups are bringing forth their ideas, whether it's 10 big ideas or, um, so we don't know what happened. We just finished our first draft of our paper and put it out there. And then we don't really know what will happen after that. But, you know, that may be like the um, kind of reaching the end of the project where we're starting to put these big ideas out into the world. So um, the people in this room and the people who will watch on YouTube are seeing our big ideas before, um, the world is. Okay, cool. I think beside that, though, I'm wondering, Leslie, and um, well, again, it, it is there. I mean, as I say, the, the importance of this work can't just even be confined to one single channel in, in, in some senses. So, I mean, it'd be really cool to explore and know. Well, I mean, I've got absolutely no doubt knowing some of the, the characters in this meeting today, never mind some of the people in the in the project itself, um, that stuff is going to happen and stuff will be happening. Um, I guess it's making even more of that and, and how we all collectively or individually continue to fight to make sure that these things are heard and spoken and not made invisible, if you see what I mean, or continue to made uh, be made invisible. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if anybody has any specific ideas for that in the future. I'm also very conscious of the fact, though, that we are way over time. I know that people are dropping out of the meeting. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'll maybe just wrap it up there and end the recording. If anybody did want to, to continue to chat, um, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, I don't know about you, Leslie Ann. But anyway, before that, thank you all very much. Thank you so much as well to the um, to the Pluriversal Working Group as well. Thank you for your time and considering sharing this with us. As I say, it's a really, really important piece of wisdom. Um, so thank you all so much for that. Um, and I look forward to many more future conversations. Um, as I say, we're not entirely sure what's going to happen to the futures of design education series into the new year. We have a few ideas for what we might do with that ourselves. Um, um, and as I say, we'll let everybody know uh, maybe in the new year um, and maybe have a few interesting announcements to make about what we might do with that and, and where it might go. Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much once again, Leslie and, and the entire group. Fantastic stuff. Some really interesting ideas and thoughts there. And thank you so much for sharing it with us. OK, thank you all.